So thank you to Josie for hosting me in the literal sense of letting me stay at your house, and also to John and Mike and others at the Bioethics Center for hosting me more generally and inviting me to be here. Um, Josie's asked that I try to speak for about 30 minutes uh, so we can have more time for discussion, which is really the interesting part for me too. So I'll try to stay within that. I won't give this long, elaborated introduction going over the ancient history of psychedelics and so forth. I'm just going to dive right into the main points I want to make uh, as follows. So I'll cover why I'm saying the need to talk about ethics is so urgent in particular. And within that, how do I aim this? Let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, I'll be talking about ethical questions that might come up at three different levels. So one is just ethical questions that pertain to the individual user of psychedelics or a user maybe who's working with a therapist or a guide of some kind. What are the main questions that they're going to be facing or what are some challenges that they're going to be facing compared to other kinds of individual level medical concepts of, of ethics that are often raised in, in analogous spaces. This could also, of course, uh, pertain to group settings. So psychedelics have um, traditionally been used in communal or group settings, not just in this one-on-one -on -one, uh, doctor-patient kind of relationship that's more um, familiar to, to Western medical environments. I'll also be talking about the use of psychedelics or related drugs like MDMA, which isn't strictly a psychedelic. It has a different kind of mechanism of action on the brain. But um, this is now being trialed for use in couples therapy in a kind of dyadic relational context. So it isn't just is one person giving informed consent to the use of a drug, but how is this going to play out within the dynamics of a relationship between two people along with potentially a therapist or a guide or whomever. And then uh, more broadly, uh, and, and really the point of this talk, is to focus on the bigger societal questions that are raised by introducing a powerful set of drugs into society in, in, in a so-called mainstream kind of a way, where that means that the, the means by which the, these drugs can be accessed uh, will be much wider than has been true for the last 40 years or so. And so if we don't get out ahead of what kind of broader societal changes or questions are raised by this, there's, there's the potential for um, misfiring and blowback and all sorts of serious problems. So that's why I think, um, in general, this is so, so urgent to talk about. And then, as I said, I'll, I'll try to reserve most of the time, or the balance of the time anyway, for, for Q&A. So uh, there's a lot of interesting history here about why is it that psychedelics went underground in the first place? Why were they banned by the FDA? Um, you know, I hope maybe we'll talk about some of that. I'm happy to share some of that. But as most of you know, when we hear about psychedelics, probably the main cultural representation that comes up in our minds is hippies and the counterculture of the 1960s. And then they seem to sort of just have disappeared after that and at least gone out of the popular consciousness. And they're still maybe associated with countercultures or subcultures or something like that. But, you know, most ordinary people going to work aren't thinking about psychedelics most of the time. But that's starting to, to very quickly change and to change in a pretty big way through the mainstreamification of psychedelics over the last maybe 10 or 15 years to the point that now many people on the street, so to speak, may very well have heard about some of these trials coming out or potential therapeutic uses of psychedelics and so forth. And so it's becoming a much more public conversation. Now, some drugs uh, with, within this broad category have been used by indigenous communities for centuries uh, in a way where there's a lot of accumulated knowledge and including ethical knowledge, normative knowledge about how these drugs should be used. But the way that these drugs are being mainstreamed within the, the dominant culture in the United States and a lot of Western countries is through the mechanism of medicalization. So the idea is in order for people to really take these drugs seriously and to get permission from gatekeepers and regulators in, in, in the government, we have to use the methods of science and medicine and we have to run these drugs through clinical control trials and so forth. And then we'll have the really serious kind of evidence that we need to be able to uh, make these drugs seem ac acceptable to, to, a, to a broader audience. And so now you're getting, you know, neuroscientific models of what exactly are the chemical and neurochemical effects of these drugs on the brain and how it's influencing various um, uh, mental thought processes in a way that's been kind of mapped out onto scientific language. And you're also, as I say, um, trying to, to, to test whether these drugs have certain therapeutic effects in the context of clinical trials. And it, originally I had written on here, um, you know, randomized controlled clinical, clinical trials, but the control is a little bit hard to, to do because unlike a lot of psychotropic medications, psychedelics, are, it's really hard to, to, to not tell if you're in the active condition. The subjective effect is, is, is so profound in some cases that getting a proper control without, to try to rule out placebo effects or expectancy effects is actually incredibly difficult for these drugs. So 
figuring out what, you know, what leads to the changes that people see. Is it their expectance that they're going to have a change? Is it some chemical action of the drug itself? That's much harder to test for these drugs than for a lot of other kinds of chemical compounds. So to give a very broad overview, what you're finding is inc an increasing number of, of credible reports through as carefully as you can conducted studies suggesting not just you know, statistically significant, marginal, somewhat measurable results like you get with some classic uh, drugs like um, SSRIs for depression. You know, this is the most widely prescribed drug, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression and anxiety. And if you go look at the studies where the, the, the treatment effect is demonstrated, it's, it's an extremely tiny, barely detectable effect over placebo. And yet that's, that's taken to be this, you know, a, a reason to then give this drug to millions of people. Now, in contrast to that, with some of these psychedelic drugs, you're not just seeing statistically significant effects, you're seeing massive clinically significant effects, like people who have had incurable depression for many years suddenly not being depressed anymore at all, like for a long time after using this substance once or twice. And so some of these effects, they don't apply to everybody, but you're seeing in some cases, in a subset of the people who have been in these trials, radically life-changing, massive, um, definitely detectable, clinically significant effects. And in addition, the classical psychedelic drugs are not addictive. Uh, and so unlike many you know, widely prescribed medicines, like the, think of the opioid crisis, where you have officially approved, medically tested, government you know, approved uh, drugs that are, are incredibly addictive and it, it just ruining people's lives. So now you have people thinking, well, we have this other class of substances that don't have that particular problem. And on some of these substances, you can't really overdose on them either, in the sense that you can, you can in, in principle, take these drugs at very high doses, and you're not going to have a physiological breakdown. Uh, I've put an asterisk here because physiological safety is not the only kind of safety that you might be interested in. There's also your mental well-being, your, your sense of having an identity and a self that's relatively coherent. And sometimes people uh, who have problems with schizophrenia or psychosis or some other kinds of issues can have very seriously bad experiences on these drugs. And so... When you hear about um, safe and effective or clinically tested or the kind of language that gets thrown around to suggest that th these drugs are just totally safe, what they're talking about is physiological safety. You're not going to die if you take these drugs, but you might lose your mind. And so that's something that has to be emphasized. So some of the major kinds of conditions that have seen pretty significant treatment effects in the early trials so far include treatment-resistant major depression, anxiety, and existential dread in patients who have cancer with terminal um, diagnoses, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in war veterans and first responders, um, and even people who have been trying to quit smoking for decades uh, after, again, one or two therapy-guided sessions um, are finding that they're able to break the habit for with very long-lasting effects. So all, that, all, all that's kind of, um, you know, sounds pretty exciting. I'm going to try to temper some of that excitement in, in a couple of slides just to make sure we don't rush off into a big hype bubble. Um, but I'll just add a few more interesting findings that are, that are coming out um, from, from work going back to 2006 and, and uh, even earlier. Um, in 2006, there was a big study published by uh, Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University on the effect of psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms, on uh, healthy volunteers. And so these are people for whom they were not trying to treat any diagnosable mental health condition but people who seem to be pretty mentally healthy in some sense uh, already to see what the physiological effects of the drugs were and so forth. And what they found is that many of these people were reporting that this, again, single or maybe two or three um, therapist-guided drug-enhanced um, sessions constituted for them some of the top most meaningful experiences in their lives, uh, comparable to the, the, the birth of their first child or the death of their parent or something like that. So that's not the sort of thing that happens in medicine very often, where you're having radically life-changing, meaning-changing types of experiences. So already you're going to tell we're going to have to have some kind of normative framework that can accommodate these, these substances which don't fit the mold for what we're used to talking about with a lot of normal medicine, so to speak. So as I said, people are reporting among the most meaningful life experiences of this kind of magnitude. And they'll, they'll, uh, they'll also mention that just they feel in general better. Now, again, these are people for whom we're not treating a, a condition. So they say, my life is just enhanced in some way. I feel like a better person. I feel more resilient. I feel better able to work through problems with my spouse. I feel like I have a generally happier mood as I go through life. 
And so this raises some very interesting questions that are classic to bioethics, which is, is medicine just about treating diseases where we have to come up with a disease category and we get a whole bunch of people to agree, okay, that counts as a disease. And then we you know, can apply the drug only to those people who have been diagnosed with this officially approved disease. Or might we have to think about, can we somehow make accessible drugs to people because it might help them have a better life in some way, irrespective of whether they have any kind of diagnosable disease? So this, this debate, which has been going on for ages, ever since the introduction of Prozac a long time ago, um, is now coming to the fore again in a, in a turbocharged kind of a way. So all of these exciting findings are leading to some extremely rapid social changes and legal changes and regulatory changes, including um, you know, movement toward decriminalizing uh, some of these drugs as well as, as other drugs in, in many different um, uh, states and, and at the country level. These discussions are now happening as well. There's regulatory changes. Um, the state of Oregon in the United States, where I come from, is now, I think this year, starting a model where the, the drugs will not just be decriminalized in the sense that you won't be punished if you use them, but that they'll be made available at these kind of quasi-treatment centers where if you meet certain criteria, you're 21 and you sign a form and you meet certain checks, you can just go there and use the drugs legally for enhancement purposes, uh, for because you want to, because maybe you think it's a fun way to explore your consciousness or something. You don't have to give them a reason. And so Oregon is now trying to, to say, you know, what happens if we acknowledge that these powerful drugs are already being used widely by people under illegal circumstances to do more than treat you know, mental illness, but to explore their consciousness. Why couldn't that be a, a valid thing that a person could do with a powerful substance? Why do we only have to think of things in terms of medical terms? And it's, it's striking to see that now in a, in a, a major US state, uh, lawmakers have, have been convinced to go along and try this out. Well, sure, let's just acknowledge that. So you're seeing all these big changes, including an upsurge of interest from big pharmaceutical companies who want to see if they can get a slice of the pie somehow, and business investors who are expecting this psychedelic renaissance to come and transform society, and you know, billions of dollars are going to somehow be made off of the, the back of these changes. And so, as I alluded to earlier, all of this excitement is leading to the first major potential, I guess it's an ethical problem, it's some kind of problem, which is uh, the problem of hype. And what happens when you get too excited about some set of changes, even if there's something really to be excited about, is you start to get a little bit sloppy about the details and you start to not add so many qualifications in as maybe you should. And then the, the technology or the drug in this case can start to be used in ways that are maybe not quite as well controlled or responsible as you would have hoped. So it's not just that people are using them in a clinically controlled environment with a therapist, but they're using them in a hot warehouse at a dance all night with six other drugs and a bunch of drinking and then they die. And then the last time that happened, which was you know, back in the 1970s and 80s with MDMA and so forth, it triggered a conservative backlash and led to these drugs going underground for 40 years. So I think hype is an extremely serious problem. And I think any of the scientists and the uh, clinical researchers and so forth who are touting these major important and genuinely interesting and exciting findings have to always be doing so with a measure of, of care and caution not to be um, over extrapolating from the kinds of results that they actually have. So I'll give you a real life example of this. Um, you know, Josie mentioned that Professor Savlescu and I wrote this book and we had some commenters give um, official commentary on, on our book in a kind of a, a symposium. And one of the commenters was this really prominent bioethicist, like a really smart person who is incredibly nuanced in their thinking about all manner of topics. And in, in uh, his response to us, he wrote, um, in response to our suggestion that ideally it would be most prudent at least for these drugs to be used within the context of a, a, of a guided session with somebody who knows what's going on, who can anticipate problems as they arise, who has, a, has some sort of built-in knowledge about how best to help shepherd such an experience toward a positive outcome, uh, rather than the, than the kinds of risks I was mentioning before. This is what that uh, bioethicist said. Well, listen, if a chemical intervention has been shown to be effective and safe, and if a competent individual consents to it, then uh, using it without any kind of therapy should be uh, morally acceptable, and it might even be morally mandatory if it has all these fabulous uh, benefits that you've been talking about. And so this is really striking to me because this wasn't some guy on the internet. This was like a really thoughtful person being like, well, it's been demonstrated apparently. I just read your book. You know, you said these drugs are safe and effective, so let's go. And in response, uh, we said, well, listen, what we said in our book wasn't just they're safe and effective in every environment as used by anyone under any conditions. You know, it's, it, you know drugs are not just safe and effective because of the properties of the drugs. They're the properties of the drugs as used by the user in a certain context. 
And so if you get evidence for safety and, and efficacy under some conditions, it's under those conditions that you got those effects. You, didn't, you, you can't just generalize outside of the context of the trial. So um, we said both MDMA and psychedelics administered at the right dose by a trained therapist in an enclosed peaceful setting in the context of a well-established therapeutic protocol, drug purity having been assured, with medical staff on hand to mon uh, monitor vital signs and alert you to any potential problems, has been shown to be physiologically safe and effective, or uh, rather efficacious, meaning within the context of a trial, um, at treating, reducing symptoms of some well-defined psychiatric disorders, as well as some other psychological constructs, like um, positive traits like uh, psychological flexibility, in not just anybody, but uh, pre-screened and adequately prepared individuals over the course of the study period, which isn't forever. That's just as long as they took measurements for. Now, some of these trials have had some pretty long-term follow-up, like for several years. And in some of these cases, the findings have persisted over those several years, with people coming back six months later and a year later and saying, yep, I still don't, I'm not depressed, and I'm, my life is very much improved, and that still was one of the most meaningful experiences I ever had. So we have some long-term data, but we don't have really long-term data for, for all these things. So, if you, I mean, it's hard to, s that's just one sentence, by the way. I've split it up over three bullet points because I'm trying to illustrate for you how many qualifications you have to pack in to your understanding of like each and every word in the sentence for it to be a scientifically accurate phrase. But just see how easy it is for people to kind of ignore all those qualifiers because it sounds pretty exciting and there's some pretty cool results that have come out. So my bigger point is we've got all these new neuroscience models and medicine and psychiatry and clinical trials and legal changes coming, regulation changes and business investment and big pharma interests. And all of this is kind of rushing along at, at breakneck speed. And what I'm suggesting is if we don't have at least as much investment in really smart, thoughtful people and stakeholders from all different environments, you know, indigenous users who have had a lot of uh, experience with these drugs in a certain context, medical people talking to people from other uh, sectors of society, bioethicists, hopefully. If we don't have at least as much investment in the ethical implications of using these drugs, that's a serious problem. And the risk is very real because the, the big worry I have is that that hype bubble will burst at some point. Then you're going to get the backlash like you saw at the end of the hippie era. And then these drugs are going to go back underground for another 50 years. And I think that's bad because I really do think that the effects that are being reported for a subset of users under those carefully qualified conditions are life-changingly important for things that otherwise can't be treated, like treatment-resistant de depression, for PTSD, which can just ruin people's lives and their marriages and their relationships and so forth. So if we have these substances which have an enormous and unparalleled capacity to radically positively change people's lives, but can also really have some bad outcomes if they're not carefully used, feeding into the hype is like totally irresponsible and wrong because it, it could very easily, just for normal sociological reasons, lead to a massive kind of blowback from you know, some conserv conservative government regulator who heard about some kid getting you know, uh, sick and uh, wants to protect people, and so then they pass all this you know, uh, uh, draconian legislation. That's a very real risk, and so I think that's why the ethics are so important here. So I, I said I'm going to tell you about some individual level uh, ethical issues. This is just to illustrate the kinds of questions that I think we should be thinking about, both bioethicists and professional people who think about these questions, but also just society in general. We all need to be having this conversation together. Um, uh, relational questions and societal questions. So let me start with the individual level. Now, in bioethics and in medicine, you know, the bare bones minimum kind of ethical requirement that has to be met is that somebody that you're going to give a substance to or administer some procedure to has to give consent, meaning that not just that they just say yes, but that it's informed and it's morally valid in some way. They have, they have some grasp of what you're actually telling them. Now, in reality, what happens is a lot of hospitals have these forms that are really just legal protections for them that aren't really serving the moral purpose of informed consent, which is to respect the uh, autonomous decision-making capacity of the person who's who's actually going to have some experience um, at stake. Nevertheless, you know, that bare minimum kind of threshold to cross is going to be even harder in the case of psychedelics for some reasons I'll, I'll illustrate. And one has to do with this issue of hype, which I was just telling you about. So this is a recent article that, that came out where uh, a gentleman named Stephen uh, Petro shares about his own experience, where uh, rather than having a life-changing, beautiful, harmonious, singing with the birds kind of experience, and in this case on ketamine, uh, which is, again, has a different mechanism of action from the classical psychedelics, but it's, it's among the drugs that are being trialed in this, this period, uh, was absolutely life-changingly terrifying, life rather than positive. 
So I'll just share some quotes from this article. My ears perked up in recent months when I began to hear the buzz about ketamine, the anesthetic and hallucinogenic drug that has uh, been found a new market as an antidepressant. Numerous credible studies have documented benefits, including that it is fast acting, with patients sometimes showing improvement within a couple of days. And social and other media have featured doctors and patients describing it as life changing for them, with one user commenting that I felt like a completely new person. Well, I got a referral from my therapist, and soon enough I found myself on a new psychiatrist's couch, a doctor specifically trained to administer the drug. So I just am emphasizing that because this is like a best case scenario. This isn't somebody experimenting in their basement, you know, with some friends. This is somebody who is, in fact, um, who was uh, taking the drug with somebody who trained at Yale School of Medicine where the original trials have been done. So this is literally the best case scenario you could get. Somebody who's the most knowledgeable person about how to administer these drugs. So after, after determining I was medically healthy and otherwise eligible, so we, we met that pre-screening appropriately selected candidate uh, criterion I mentioned, um, this psychiatrist briefed me in detail on all the possible side effects, uh, short-term spikes in blood pressure, headache, nausea, vomiting, and so forth. So again, that's that physiological sense of safety that I was telling you about. Um, the nine-page consent form also included this sentence, which wasn't just about physiological issues, but about kind of uh, mental issues and, and meaning issues. So I'll just share this. At the dosage level administered to you, you are likely to experience mild anesthetic, uh, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and potentially psychedelic effects. Well, what does that mean? The form included um, commonly reported side effects, such as a loss of sense of self, um, what, what, what does that mean exactly? Changes in the perception of time, dreamlike visions, and feelings of connection, joy, and peace. So you have a nine-page consent form, which tells you all about the physiological effects and this and that, and what you need to know. And then there's one sentence, and there's like, you might lose your sense of self, and um, you know, there's a couple of other effects that, 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 that might happen along the way. And so what he says is, in looking back after the terrifying experience he describes in the article, which I won't share with you, um, I, I realized I didn't fully appreciate what that meant. So this goes to, to show you, here you have the most well-trained person you could possibly be working with who knows everything about the drug, who gives you a nine-page consent form and goes with, with you through it to make sure that you're being properly consented before you have this, uh, this intense experience. And this person says, yeah, but I actually didn't, I had no idea what that really meant. P potential loss of sense of self. I mean, you need to s watch a whole training video or something to understand that one sentence in the consent form. You can't just intuitively go with what you think it means especially with all the hype, right? Because you've ho everybody said they had life-changing positive experiences. So I don't know, it's probably not something bad. So there's a really nice commentary that uh, William Smith and Dominic Sisti uh, put together for the Journal of Medical Ethics, in which they tried to give kind of a philosophical gloss on what these so-called transformative experiences that many people report in having these drugs imply for standard models of rational decision-making, autonomous decision-making in the context of medical ethics. So they write, when, when beneficial, the psychedelic experience is characterized by features that are unlike those of the whole rest of the pharmacopoeia of substances that are currently used. Um, these include senses of losing, losing self-importance, ineffable knowledge, feelings of unity and connection with others, and encountering deep reality or God. In addition to symptom relief, psychedelic experiences often lead to significant changes in a patient's personality and worldview. So, this raises some interesting questions for whether a person could even in principle give autonomously informed rational consent to the use of these drugs. I, I say that I'm referring to a paper by Laurie Paul, a, a philosopher at Yale, who came up with the notion of transformative experience as a technical concept within philosophy. And she's worked through this in incredible detail and she goes to show that there's certain kinds of experiences we can have in life, which she calls transformative experiences, that are such that before we've had the experience, we cannot possibly make certain kinds of rational decisions about what it will be like on the other side of the experience because there's a certain kind of experiential knowledge that comes through the experience that would be necessary for making such a rational judgment. And so she's given this really interesting account of how certain types of experiences are ones that we actually can't consent to in the sense of we rationally grasp the relevant properties of the experience such that we can give our morally meaningful consent to them. Now, her paper has this cool title, What You Can't Expect When You're Expecting, and what she uses to illustrate this point is somebody who is going to give birth to their first child. And is anybody here who's ever given birth to a first child? I myself have not, so I'm going on testimony here. But the testimony suggests that it can be radically life-changing for people. Their whole sense of their value structure can be turned topsy-turvy. Their sense of their own self-importance 
can suddenly be outstripped by the thought that maybe somebody else is much more important than anything they thought about themselves and so forth. So what I want to say is it isn't true that psychedelics are the only way to have a transformative experience. You know, people who convert religions, for example, sometimes will have a totally transformative experience. Um, you know, uh, giving birth or having a parent die can be a transformative experience peop for people. So psychedelics aren't the only way to have these experiences. And then I, I want us to think through, well, what does that imply for whether you could consent to a transformative experience? Now, it seems to me that you're at least able to give agreement, morally meaningful agreement, to the kinds of activities that could lead to giving birth to a child, like having sex with somebody and getting pregnant. So we don't go in those cases and we say every act of sex that could potentially result in a child is non-consensual because you can't possibly appreciate what the implications of that are. Otherwise, that would imply that almost all sex is rape on the legal definition. So this, you can take this a couple of different ways. One thing you might say is this whole informed consent idea that we just squeeze in there to try to solve all our ethical dilemmas maybe can't do the work we need it to do because in our ordinary life, we have transformative experiences that it seems we can give meaningful agreement to Agreement that, that, that means that we're participating in the decision-making process in a way that, that is appropriate that doesn't meet the conditions of informed consent. And so maybe, maybe we need to rethink informed consent. Maybe that's not the concept we should appeal to. Another, another potential difference between um, giving birth to your first child and having a, a naive psychedelic experience out of nowhere is that when you're giving birth to your first child, that's something that is ensconced within cultural narratives about what that will mean and there's com community knowledge that's shared in channels both formal and informal and there's rituals that happen around this I mean going to the hospital of course is a ritual right you can give birth many different ways um, for a long time births were not done in hospitals they were done with midwives out in the community and so now we have a birth ritual which is a hospitalized one so you go there and then somebody wears a white jacket and they do certain things and then they give you your test information and then they tell you this and that it's a ritual but what it means is that we expect certain things about what it will be like because we have some cultural experience with them, we've practiced them, we've heard about them, we have a conceptual framework within which we can have the experience and so forth. So even though we don't know exactly what it will be like to give birth to our first child, we have, we have maybe enough of a sense of how to make it fit with other things in our world experience. Whereas if, you, if somebody just says, and here's a psychedelic drug and you take it and then all of a sudden you have a life-changing experience, you might not have the resources to then integrate that in with all the rest of the stuff that you know about reality. And then that can lead to these terrifying experiences. So, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the indigenous experience with drugs like ayahuasca, for example, going back for centuries, is that um, they're not saying, did you give informed consent to your use of the ayahuasca substance? But there, there's myths and rituals and lore and expectance, uh, expe ex expectance that's, that's co-created with other, others in the community about what your experience will be like. And it might well be that that's a really important insight for, for how you know, the mainstream culture uh, should be thinking about the use of these drugs. They have to be done in a, in a way that actually respects the power of the experience by building up the right kinds of rituals and narratives and folklore and so forth that we need just like we've done with birth and other important life experiences. Okay, so I've probably, yeah, I've already gone for half an hour. Okay, uh, I'm going to speed through the next uh, uh, section of the talk here so we can, we can have a chance to have some discussion. Um, I now want to just talk about what happens when you introduce a drug into the context of a relationship. So now we're already going beyond the idea that you yourself have to make an autonomous rational decision, but you and your partner, let's say, have to decide whether you want to go through something together. So um, I'm going to be focusing on, on a long-term relationship uh, in, in a romantic context. Now, um, in 2017, the FDA uh, designated MDMA, which on the street is known as ecstasy, um, as a breakthrough therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And their work was, um, had to do with these scientific trials that had to do with treating individual level PTSD. The person with PTSD comes into the clinic and takes this drug and talks to the therapist and then reports all these improvements. Um, Professor Savlescu and I wrote this whole book saying people are not just islands. We are all embedded within relationships and within communities and within societies. And so, especially in the case of psychedelics, which are as powerful as they are, it's simply not going to cut it to rely on this autonomous individual, everyone's an island, here's your drug, here's your symptom, I'm going to treat your symptom with my drug, and then, and then that's all there to say. Um, especially since some of these drugs have been used in the context of relationship therapy in the past to some very interesting effects. So I'll, I'll share with you a little bit of that history. Oh, now I already said what Josie said, which is that the, the book has two different titles in case anybody's confused, but the content is the same. It's just marketing or something. Um, 
So what, what we try to say in this section of the book is that if you treat PTSD successfully, it doesn't just have implications for the individual. It has implications for their relationship. Partly because PTSD can absolutely ruin relationships. Like marriages that have been happy for many years, somebody has a traumatic experience, they bring the PTSD back into the relationship, and it's like, I don't even know who you are, you're not the person I married, violent outbursts and so forth. So in a, in a sort of straightforward way, if you successfully treat PTSD, you're kind of going to treat relational problems as well, just as a side effect of, of treating, treating the P PTSD. But to go back to that point I made earlier about the treatment enhancement distinction, do you, do you have to have PTSD to be able, in some sense, to access this psychedelic experience? What if you're dealing with just ordinary relational difficulties? You know, what, maybe there's a whole swath of people who could benefit from one or the other or both of them using these drugs under the right kind of well-controlled um, context to, to find that they can, in some sense, heal from, if you want to use that language, not any clinically diagnosable disorder, but just the really ordinary challenges that we all face in trying to live our lives and have good relationships. So that's what we try to talk about in the book. So historically, um, up until the 1985 or so, when MDMA and the psychedelic drugs were listed as Schedule I substances, I won't tell you that history, but it was just a, a, a totally inappropriate to have banned them at the time based on the evidence that was available, because the drugs were being used in therapeutic contexts to good effect. They also had escaped from the lab and were being used at raves and dance parties in an irresponsible way. And then the government just said, well, we'll just ban the drugs in every context, including for research, including for therapists. That was just totally wrong. Uh, actually quite devastating. I mean, think of the millions of people who could potentially have had important, meaningful therapeutic experiences that were denied that because of this very clumsy, ham-fisted government response. Um, but prior to that, these drugs were being used by therapists legally, and the, the psychiatrists Greer and Tolbert share about their experience um, with about 80 clients from 1980 to 1985. They argue that MDMA with a therapist, administered in the right way with a trained guide, can help individuals achieve, as they say, a more healthy and accurate perspective of who and what they are psychologically by decreasing irrational fear responses to perceived emotional threats. So partly what happens is um, MDMA uh, releases a ton of serotonin, the brain's own serotonin releases into the brain, and it suppresses automatic uh, trigger fear responses that you might otherwise have. And this is why it seems to be so impressive for PTSD, because if I go to, to a talk therapist and they say, tell me about your time in the war, I just get this automatically triggered response where I shut down completely and I don't want to talk about it. And the problem then is that talk therapy isn't going to be very helpful to me, because I'm simply unwilling in this extremely defensive, immediate, gut, you know, visceral way, I don't want to talk about it. So if you could take a drug in a safe environment that directly suppresses that hair trigger fear response and allows allows you to kind of get back into those memories without just shutting down, you can start to see how it might um, enhance the effects of talk therapy. So um, as I just said, MDMA temporarily reduces those fear responses by working directly on emotional centers of the brain. It imbues users with a deep sense of love and acceptance of themselves and others, which are the perfect conditions for trauma therapy. Now, I'm not going to go into this in this particular talk, but you might have questions here about authenticity. So, you know, if I have this deep feeling of love and acceptance for everybody around me that is the effect of a chemical that I just swallowed half an hour ago, you might think, well, is that really love? I mean, what are, is that just some drug-induced illusion or something that you're having? So there's some very interesting questions there. Maybe we'll talk about those during, during the Q&A. Um, so uh, clients would report feeling more loving toward their partners, that they could more easily forgive the pain of the past, that they could let go of grudges and misunderstandings. They say, we never recommended MDMA to anyone who would be a passive participant, who thought they would just somehow be cured of a psychological problem. We believe that the person treated or cured themselves with the assistance of MDMA and their therapeutic relationship. So the take-home point here, and why Professor Savalescu and I stress that these drugs ought not to just be used casually, like you go pick them up at the pharmacy or something and try it in, in your house and hope everything works, is that the drug is supposed to facilitate a, it, it's supposed to en enhance the effects of a therapeutic session. It's not supposed to just cause the effects by itself. And so the therapeutic session is part of the treatment effect. It's, part, it's like drug plus therapy is what's being measured and studied in these trials, not just drug. Um, so the effects of the drug wear off after, you know, a, a, a number of hours. And MDMA doesn't just magically create these relational enhancements. Um, it's really the lessons learned and the insights that are gained during the therapeutic session which the couples then need to take with them into their normal waking consciousness and practice and implement within their relationship in a responsible, active, conscious way. It's not just uh, being a passive participant. 
So uh, my last bit here is just to move from the relational level to the whole society-wide level. Often what happens is you get a lot of scientific interest in a new drug or technology, as I've been describing, where you get these scientific hype bubbles. And then you, um, you're able to then you know, use this technology to manipulate things about a person's life or psychology or their body or whatever it is, and those can sort of be measured to some extent. And often what happens is that the ethicists who come onto the scene to try to evaluate what to say about this new drug or technology keep their focus really on the level of the technological manipulation. You know, what kind of effects does it have for the person and what ethical questions are raised by that? You know, the sorts of questions I was just talking about. And so what you sometimes end up with is this, this very narrow kind of evaluation of, of, of the ethics that are at stake in something where you're coming up almost like with a philosophical trolley problem of if, if, you, if you had you know, a couple with this particular condition and they were dealing with that and under these 12 further assumptions, could it be permissible for them to use a drug? And in fact, most of the first several papers that Professor Savalescu and I published had that kind of uh, tone to them. We were trying to say, imagine a case where everything is exactly idealized for our purposes. You know, could we at least say it could be permissible to use a drug under those conditions? And then a bunch of critics rightly said, yeah, but I mean, that's not reality. Reality is that these drugs will be used under many different kinds of conditions, and they'll be accessible to people in many different sectors of society. And so we have to be thinking about the wider social implications, which you know, I completely agree with the criticism, and so that's where we focused more recently. So I'll stick with the example of using these drugs uh, to affect our romantic and relational lives, but I'll, I'll talk about the kind of wider social implications of that. One worry is that we'll, we'll start to medicalize more areas of our life, and it's been very ex well expressed by the sociologist John Evans, so I'll just read his quote. Um, Many people have reached the normative conclusion that they don't want to live in a world where increasing swaths of human experience are under the logic of medicine. There are or should be experiences that use an older logic, which are under the jurisdiction of another profession or under no profession at all. We can all fear the medicalization of love. And so this is like, that's the bright red line we should not cross. There's certain experiences where we just shouldn't be introducing drugs or medicine into them at all, no matter how helpful we think they'll be. So in the wider sociology literature, there are several ways that this fear of medicalization gets cashed out in terms of more specific fears. So one is that in order to give people a drug under the current model, you have to call the drug medicine. And in order for something to count as medicine, it has to treat a disease. And so the problem here is that when you find out that a drug can just help people in some way, and you want to give it to them to help them, you now have to come up with a disease that they have to explain why, under the current logic of medicine, it's permissible to give them the drug. And so what happens is, all, you know, all the time, this happens under current medical conditions is, people will find that a drug can do something that people like or that helps them or that improves their life in some way, and then they have to come up with new pathological categories to be like, oh, you have, you know, relationship commitment disorder or something like that. So that's why you should be allowed to use this drug. And now people have to start thinking of their whole lives, including their relationships, under pathological clinical indices or something like that, rather than in terms of literature or philosophy or poetry or something. Maybe that's how they should be thinking about these things. There's also just the expansion of medical social control, you know, over more and more areas of our lives. There's the narrow focus, as I've been talking about, on individuals and on biological processes rather than the, the, the wider context. And as I alluded to, but as I won't uh, talk about here, there's the threat to authenticity. The thought that these drugs are bringing about facsimiles of what we care about, you know, something that feels like love, but maybe it isn't really love, and maybe we should be concerned about that. So in the last few minutes, I'm just going to focus on a subset of these medicalization worries, um, specifically that they, they lead to the narrow focus on individuals and biological processes rather than thinking about the social context uh, that might be relevant to what's going on. So uh, Peter Conrad is a, is a distinguished uh, sociologist who's done some of the, the best work on this. And in this book, The Medicalization of Society, he says, medicalization can obscure the social forces that influence our well-being. For example, by focusing completely on the neurobiological features of some condition, it might be seen as a genetic or a biological problem and thus treated predominantly with drugs. Um, in another classic text, uh, Barbara Wooten writes um, simply, always it's easier to put up a clinic than to pull down a slum. And so you see the point here. It's, it's that when you medicalize a problem and you introduce um, a biological solution to it, it's not just that you seem to ignore the social context, it's that you disincentivize dealing with the social context, because now you kind of have a, something that looks like a solution. So if you have a slum and you put up a clinic, well, now some of the problems that had to do with being in a slum and the health problems seem to be addressed, so just leave the slum there, instead of thinking, well, why are some people have to live in a slum in the first place? 
it's now, now you're actively disincentivized from thinking of you know, g g wider social and governmental responses to that. Here's another way of illustrating the point from a, a New Yorker article by Jonah Lehrer. He says, um, there's a psychiatrist who is very eager to help his patients, but he failed to distinguish between suffering that was rooted in his patients' dysfunctional bodies and suffering that was rooted in their minds or their social contexts. So he gives the, gives the example of this uh, doctor talking to a patient. In this case, I think he's treating depression with SSRIs, is the, the specific example. Um, he says to her, how, how is your medication working out? It's working great. I feel so much better. But I'm still married to the same alcoholic son of a bitch. It's just that now he's tolerable. Like, you could spend an hour just unpacking this case, because, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean she shouldn't take this drug. I mean, I don't know. Can she leave the relationship or can't she? There's all sorts of things that go into this kind of analysis. Sometimes a drug is the best you can do. But again, if you disincentivize leaving the relationship in this example, then maybe what you do is you sort of trap somebody in a situation that they ought to, that they have an all things considered reason to do. So commenting on this kind of scenario, these authors say, you know, the first and most obviously intervention, uh, uh, mo most obviously justified intervention in cases like this is not to drug the woman into unfeeling, but to alert the authorities to, in this case, it was commenting on an abusive relationship, alert the authorities to the violence and um, refer her to supportive social and legal services. Now, like point well taken. Um, nevertheless, Laura Purdy in this famous article in Bioethics from 2001, commenting on these kinds of uh, cases says, you know, the points imply that women's health will be far better protected by political action than by, as it were, mere medicalization. But does it follow from that that women's health should therefore be excluded from the medical realm? Surely not, because even in the best of circumstances, at least some proportion of women will require all the help that medicine can offer, which might include the use of a drug under some conditions. And such help needs to be made available to them uh, when, when it's all things considered going to improve their situation. So uh, the ethicist Christina Gupta, elaborating on this, says, you know, it isn't either or. You either medicalize a problem or you focus only on social and legal responses. Medicine and society and law are all going to be there all the time working together in this roiling, complicated way. And we can't necessarily even isolate the effects from one, to the one uh, uh, against the other. So it's not either individual or social solutions. The individual and the structural and the biological and the social are co-constitutive. Interventions that are aimed at the individual may be effective and may have reverberating effects on the wider social issues and vice versa. You know, maybe if a medical intervention al allows me to get over my current feelings of depression that have been pre preventing me from leaving a relationship, then it, it, it enables me to then make some broader social change to my life. Uh, and so you have to then think through how are the ways that medicalization can actually lead to changes in the social sphere. I would simply encourage scholars considering the ethics of biotechnologies to address problems that have both individual and social components to emphasize the importance of integrating these uh, interventions to see how they might work in tandem to achieve change. So I think that's basically the right idea and we've been trying to um, adopt such an approach in our, our latest work. So um, Eric Perens at the Hastings Center uh, has written an important a paper where he distinguishes between good and bad forms of medicalization. A blanket condemnation of medicalization would fail to acknowledge the respects in which women and men and people of any gender use medical technologies to gain control over their lives and genuinely to promote their own flourishing. And so um, what we've said is by anticipating some of the specific ways in which these technologies could yield unwanted outcomes, bioethicists and others in society can help to direct the course of love's medicalization uh, should it happen to occur more toward the good side than the bad. And so that's why I think we need to have this conversation. There are a lot of real risks that come along with medicalizing aspects of life through psychedelics and other drugs. There are also serious benefits, but the only way you get the benefits without too many risks is by thinking through the ethics. And so that's why we need to have this conversation. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, that was more than 30 minutes. <laughs> I really tried. Sorry, everybody. But um, yeah, so uh, open questions as far as I I'm concerned. When people ask you a question, if you somewhat repeat it in your answer, then the sure. people who are, are not in the room but others can hear you. Yeah, of course. So any questions? I know there was like a train coming at you with all this information, but uh, yes, Mike. Yeah. So Mike is saying, what about that authenticity objection that I alluded to but failed to address? <laughs> um, I think it's a very real and, and a serious objection, and it's not simply to be glossed over or ignored. This was really a matter of, of time. Um, it, it, prior to the 1980s, when MDMA uh, was more widely being used, including in social settings, even those who were using it recreationally would give warnings to each other that if you meet somebody under the influence of MDMA at a festival, 
you should not go get married to them immediately because probably you've met them under an altered state of mind that doesn't reflect the wider reality of your circumstances or even your compatibility with that person. And you might well make a decision uh, under an altered state of mind that um, isn't in your long-term best interest and in some sense doesn't ref track reality. Now that isn't just true of MDMA, you know, some people meet each other under the influence of alcohol and get high on just the new feelings of new love and then they rush off and get married and then it turns out that they're totally incompatible. So I think the general lesson here is there's lots of ways to alter our mental states in ways that may not be durable or sustainable or may cause us to misrepresent the all things considered reality of the situation. And that's true of drugs, it's true of just um, the, uh, the kind of uh, having a crush on someone say you don't have any drugs at all. I mean, our brain releases drugs like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and vasopressin and so forth and adrenaline. And so all those things can, can distort our sense of reality too, where we think this is the best person who's ever been born when actually we may ha have totally incompatible values. So I think that, you know, we need to, as Christina Gupta was saying, integrate whatever the neurochemical effects that are happening with questions of what are our actual values and what actually is sustainable. And should we take a cool down period before we make a life changing decision um, after having our brains altered in this way. So I don't think that love is just down to neurochemistry. We have a biopsychosocial concept of love, which is that love just is something that exists at the interface of what's happening in our brains, our subjective experiences, and the social concepts that help us pick out what even counts as love in a given era. So, um, you know, any of those things can change. You can change love by having social campaigns pains to say, listen, you know, gay people, what they experience, that's love too, which a lot of people didn't think for a long time. And so the, the, def the social definition of love was made to change to good effect. But what it's like to be in love has a certain kind of feeling that's also influenced by that. If you're a gay couple in a homophobic society and you're walking down the street, you can't really hold hands. And if you can't hold hands and you aren't gonna experience the subjective stuff that goes along with holding hands with your partner out in society and so forth. And then also when you hold hands with somebody, you release oxytocin. <laughs> and oxytocin is having certain effects at the brain. So you have to integrate across what's going on biologically, subjectively and psychologically and also in terms of the social sphere. Yes? Yeah, so the questioner is asking about what to say about informed consent, which as I suggested is complicated by the fact that these psychedelic drugs often induce life-changing experiences for people or transformative experiences such that they can never really intuitively grasp what it will be like to be on the other side. So how can we have a meaningful informed consent? So the lesson that I think comes from the example I use is that simply signing a nine page consent form is definitely not enough. And the bigger point to make is when we have something like informed consent and we operationalize it in a certain way, so we say informed consent just means signing this nine page form, we often forget what was the point of the thing that we were doing in the first place. The moral point of informed consent is letting somebody make an informed decision consistent with their values to the extent that they can grasp what's at stake. That's the point of it. So then we have to ask, in this case, what would achieve that point? It's not going to be a consent form, but it might be some sort of immersive video experience where you say, you maybe put, give people VR goggles or something and say, you know, you might, your sense of time and reality may change. You know, here's a video with people giving testimonies about what it was like before and after they had their treatment experience. Here's some interviews with past patients or something like that. So I think an immersive consent experience ought to be required in, in these cases rather than just the pro forma legalistic language, which is what's the standard now. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, um, do we know about any social demographic categories or cultural differences that might influence what it's like for somebody to experience a drug? And yes, the answer is yes. So Monica Williams has done a lot of important work on the neglect of a racial dimension to these initial trials and the sharing of results because overwhelmingly it's people who look like me, just like me, who are doing the science and who are um, promulgating information socially about what these findings are like and also most of the initial patients in the trials are um, of a certain age, white and overwhelmingly male. And Monica says, you know, as a black woman, if I go into a, a medical setting, that has very different resonances to me. And if you're now saying you're gonna give me a drug, a result of which, you know, many men in my community have been incarcerated and I'm just supposed to feel totally comfortable taking this with you. I don't even know, if, is this a trick or something? Are you trying to get me to use a substance that's illegal and I don't know what's going on? And so the social meanings of taking a drug may very well be differently embedded within certain cultural frameworks, experiences, uh, social memory, and so forth. And so it's a very serious problem that there isn't more representation of people from many different walks and ways of life actually contributing to both the science and um, to the ethics. So I'm organizing a workshop in Oxford in August on the ethics of psychedelics. And our, our main concern was to make sure that the, of the 30 people in the room, it wasn't gonna be mostly people who were white men. 
And so we, we're very careful to try to make sure we have people from different communities. And I think that's the only way to figure out if, you're, if you have some serious blind spots you don't even realize. Like you didn't, it didn't even occur to you that that could be an ethical issue. So yeah, I think that's a very important concern. Yes, okay, so the question is, um, are these drugs just being used for these psychological conditions I've been talking about, like post-traumatic stress disorder? Or is there any research into whether they could help with neurological conditions? And what about um, as compared to side effects of other drugs like SSRIs, which have, an, depending on the study, up to a 20% risk of serious dampening of libido effects, which we discuss in the book as well. So um, psychedelics are not known to have libido dampening effects. Uh, sometimes some of these drugs are used in contexts where they're thought to be uh, helping with the overall sexual experience, uh, for example, by reducing inhibitions that otherwise might um, in impair that relationship. In terms of neurological disorders, I don't know specific research on that question, but I know that one of the main theoretical uh, frameworks right now is that the drugs are neuroplastic inducers, and in that what they seem to do is to um, soften uh, deeply wired connections that are otherwise hard to um, uh, change. And so you can get people to have pretty radical changes in their, in their sense of self and in other things that are sort of deeply wired in the brain. So I don't know if there's a neurological issue that um, could be well addressed by these drugs, but it, it seems like that's the sort of thing that should be looked into. But I don't know that research myself. Yeah. Sure. Yes, I will say this is early days in research. So the fact that there's already this hype happening and there's concerns about a hype bubble is interesting because um, this research has only just begun in the last 10 to 15 years where you're starting to have bigger uh, trials, controlled trials of, of the effects of these drugs for a, a narrow range of conditions. And so um, to get all this social change happening just on the initial science when there's so much more science to be done across a range of issues that haven't yet even begun to be looked at, uh, that's going to be a careful thing to balance because you want to still have the excitement and the energy so that there's still funding to look at the effects of the drugs on a wider range of categories, but you don't want people to get so excited that then you trigger that cultural backlash. Yes, there's a very interesting tension or paradox in current psychedelic science because the way that psychedelics are being made palatable to government regulators is by trying as far as possible to fit them into the scientific reductionist framework with which those sorts of regulators are most comfortable. At the same time, psychedelics by their very nature explode open the categories that are otherwise reductive. I mean, literally what they do in the brain is suppress certain types of categories, long you know, stereotypes, ways of um, parsing reality. It suppresses the categories that we're most familiar with and allows us to think flexibly. This is partly, again, why it may help with depression. Depression, on some views, is this kind of ruminating thing where you're framing reality in a certain misguided way and you can't seem to get out of that mental block. And then if you take a drug which just directly relaxes the mental block that you've been having for all these years so that all of a sudden you think, gosh, maybe I'm not such a horrible person or, wow, actually, maybe I do have interesting experiences in life um, that you otherwise weren't able to see, that's, that's you know, central to what the effects of these drugs are. So on the one hand, you're trying to get the drugs into society by taking as reductive a framework as you can to make people comfortable, to, in, in like a Trojan horse to get <laughs> this set of drugs available to people in a way that should blow open their reductive thinking across a wide range of categories. It's almost as if we need a sort of societal psychedelic to break down the exact same barriers <laughs> that we're having on the individual levels. I mean, I think that these things have to be done in a dance, right? I mean, the scientific reductive framework becomes bad when it becomes the only lens through which you view the world and it's a hammer and everything becomes a nail. But, you know, thinking quantitatively is not bad. Thinking quantitatively is beautiful when you can figure out how to map a problem onto numbers in such a way that you gain certain insights that you couldn't if you hadn't done that. A lot of risks that uh, come about from certain medical technologies aren't identifiable until you measure them and put them into a statistical model and so forth. So the problem is that then when, when you think that, that reality just reduces to those numbers, then you get the problem. So if there's some sort of improvisational dance between the psychedelic mindset and the scientific reductive mindset, then maybe you could, you know, ha have the best of both worlds, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, if there's this huge rush of investment from the pharmaceutical industry, which already has all these problems, how do we make sure that this, you know, improves our situation with pharma rather than makes things worse or directs attention away from other neglected conditions that need investment? Um, a couple things about the big pharma worry. One is that a lot of these substances can't be patented because they are, have already been invented and discovered and exist in plants and have been used for a long time. 
And so uh, MDMA, you can't patent MDMA. Now you can maybe patent a molecule that's MDMA with a few changes made to it or something like that. And so you are going to see a bunch of that. People trying to come up with psychedelic, new psychedelic substances that are slightly different from the ones that are already available. Um, so that's one way in which the, the usual money grab that would come along with, with uh, pharmaceutical companies is somewhat softened. The other thing is that with cases like PTSD, the current treatment methodology with pharm pharmaceutical drugs is to throw a whole bunch of drugs at the person that they have to take to try to manage their panoply of, s of symptoms. But if you have three psychedelic assisted sessions and then you find that you don't have any of the symptoms anymore because you've actually addressed the underlying problem like you talked through what the trauma was with your therapist and you sort of reframed it and now it doesn't get at you anymore then you stop taking the 12 other drugs that you were taking and so a number of um, individual patients who have gone through these early trials who were taking you know uh, more than a dozen drugs to manage their symptoms then they had a few number of sessions with the psychedelic assisted therapist and then they stopped taking all of the drugs except for like a one for sleep apnea or something like that. So a further possibility here is that ph the, the pharmaceutical industry runs on the medicalization model where you diagnose people with a whole bunch of illnesses and then you find individual drugs to suit the individual pathology that you came up with. But if you have a drug that just kind of can lead to a generalized sense of well-being that can help make your thinking more flexible, I mean a whole bunch of medical conditions or, or um, mental health conditions have to do with certain kind of ruminating thought loops that you get stuck in. And so it might well be that there's a range of things where people are taking lots of medications that they will no longer need. So that might be a further way of softening the problem. But there's no doubt that Big Pharma, like it will with anything that it thinks it can make money off of, will try as hard as it can to find a way to do it. So we need to be constantly vigilant, and we talk about it in the book as well. We, we, we can't just say, well, they're just going to do what they're going to do. We need to think of regulations and so forth. Uh, yes, so the question is about um, Serious misconduct, meaning sexual assault and uh, violence that's happened within the context of the underground therapy community with allegations coming to light recently that had previously been all kind of kept in-house. Um, this is a serious question and a colleague and I are working on, on this uh, right now. Um, part of why there was so much sexual abuse happening in the underground community is because the entire activity was illegal. And so what happens is if you have somebody who positions himself as a healer or a leader or a guru in some way, and what they're doing is actually helping people have life transformative experiences that are very positive and everybody in the community can see that that's happening. And then you start to hear that they've also been crossing sexual boundaries with their clients and then coming up with some sort of spiritual explanation for why that's all okay. And you're uncomfortable with that. If you then go speak to the authorities, you're now implicating yourself in an illegal activity. And so there was social structural reasons why, one, the abuses were happening because um, you have people who uh, are having experiences that the mainstream culture isn't al allowing you to have, so to speak. So you're in this special, separate, sacred space, and you're constantly noticing that when you cross certain boundaries and do something that the government doesn't know about, it can have what appear to be beneficial outcomes. And so your sense of right and wrong and what are the okay boundaries and what are the not okay boundaries can start to get a little bit skewed. So my hope and suspicion is that by bringing these drugs into the mainstream culture where there are a whole bunch of regulations around therapist-client relationships and so forth, and where there are at least some reporting structures in place. Now, by the way, there's a lot of sexual abuse in non-psychedelic therapy uh, relationships, which have to do with just power and vulnerability that are built into a lot of these things to begin with. But, and, and so that, that situation isn't, isn't dealt with either. But my hope is that compared to having this all happening out of sight and out of mind and underground, there should be a little bit more daylight. And again, my colleague and I and some others are, are thinking uh, about how to build structures in place that will incentivize people to be able to share about and report and hold accountable people who cross sexual boundaries in the context of uh, a therapy relationship.